learning that skill and hypertrophy in your pecs is worth its weight in gold. For something that isn't like an absolute truth, that whole just do things you're bad at philosophy, it performs far better than it should. So I want to kick things off in 2018. You had a series called Common Beginner Intermediate Mistakes. If you were to do that now, what three mistakes would you call out and why? So this that's one of the most difficult series I do because a lot of the time I'm training in my garage. So I get like this weird selection bias of like a lot of what the mistakes I'm seeing are stuff on the internet, which is based on like who I follow. Um, when I go to the gym in town, um, it's a very powerlifting centric gym. So I would say like in this very powerlifting centric gym, yeah, probably the most common mistake I see is people mailing in their assistance work and they're not actually taking uh, their assistance work to like the proximity to failure that we suspect is probably necessary for it to really do very much at all. And so like, you know, I see people take their, they warm up seriously, they take their technique seriously, they do their hard squatting. Uh, and then it looks, I genuinely think gun to head, there's 10 plus reps in reserve on their leg extensions. Wow. So it's like, we would get a lot better returns. And I always talk about on my channel, like most variance in strength is just explained by like cross-sectional area of the primary movers. The biggest difference between you and someone stronger than you, most of that can be explained by the cross-sectional area of like whatever the primary movers of the lift we're talking about. So we should be spending a good amount of time, especially early in our training career, but even later in our training career, uh, investing in like growing bigger muscles. It's a very, very potent way to get stronger. You know, if we're practicing our main lifts on top of that, we get some neural efficiency, some technical efficiency. Just getting bigger is a good idea. And I think people really miss out on that because they really, I think their existence work is an afterthought and they don't actually take it to, to a good proximity to failure. Their technique is probably a good deviation away from like what we really generally expect is like good hypertrophy work, like big range of motion, uh, reasonable control on the negative, progressive overload with time, yada, 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 all these things that we think like make a good productive set. I think they don't really put much thought into how to get more out of those. And if anything, that's probably some of the most important stuff a lot of these newer lifters could be doing is doing a really good job with like their kind of bodybuilding work um, afterwards. So like off the top of my head um, at my gym, that would be probably the first one that comes to mind. Um, past that, I think, yeah, I guess it really depends. Like who, what, what kind of like sub demographic are we talking about? Cause if we're talking about like bodybuilders, it might be this thing. Like if I'm talking bodybuilders, looking around the people that train at the gym in town, I think that there's this big trend of these biomechanically optimized exercises where maybe there's a big emphasis on feeling the target muscle. Um, but the overload potential or the ability to overload with time is a little bit limited. I don't think these exercises are useless. I think that if our workout is comprised of nothing but iliac pull downs and these things where we orient our body really, really precisely relative to a cable, I am of the belief we'll be leaving a little bit on the table. And I see guys come in and they'll be doing nothing but those. And I'm not like a, ooh, compounds are so much more hypertrophically stimulative. I, I was always told that coming up in lifting. And at some point I was like, well, is there really much evidence to support that? I don't actually know. Uh, but that being said, I do think when we go nothing but these TikTok exercises and we're not just doing like a basic row pattern movement, what row pattern movement we do, that's up for debate, right? Like you could say, well, I don't want to have to stabilize at my lower back. I don't want to do a bent over row. I'll do a chest support row. Sure. But do a do a row, you know, do a vertical pull, like a pull up or a pull down. We don't need to do nothing but these like hypothetically, because biomechanics, again, is only one of the criteria for assessing like what is a good set from a hypertrophy perspective. Overload is a big part of that. Range of motion is a big part of that. Uh, control of the concentric, eccentric, I mean, more eccentric than anything. I'm a big fan of like explosive con or powerful concentric, controlled eccentric, rinse and repeat, rather than tempoing through the concentric. But we have this whole amalgam of things uh, that make a productive set and aligning joint angles is only one of those criteria. GVS actually had a super good video. Um, I think it was like responding to Dr. Mike kind of talked about like, hey, range of motion is great, but we shouldn't prioritize it to the point where we take away from these other factors that contribute to a really productive set. We should put all of those things kind of on equal levels rather than prioritizing one over all of these other things that we think are useful. So like ch chasing like these circus ranges of motion at the cost of consistent overload potential probably isn't best practice. So I'd say that's another one I see with like more hypertrophy oriented people, especially like younger guys. Yeah. Hmm. I'm kind of blanking on a third though. Okay. I mean, we could, we could start with the two here. I think uh, something you said that's interesting is kind of like, I guess the optimizing on the, you know, exercise selection piece. And I think especially for beginners, it's a little bit of a trap because 
what they should do is do an exercise that they can feel comfortable with that might be easier to do, build that up. And then as they gain more experience, then start optimizing and really trying to, you know, get that, that muscle feel. Like I know that's what I did with rear delts. For example, I did a lot of heavy rows to start. I did face pulls. I did different exercises. And then as I started realizing, like I have a rear delt, I can actually feel the rear delt. Now let me optimize and really take it through what its range of motion is. But I don't I think, think we can start there. Yeah, I think that I think that's also a very, very common phenomenon with lats, right? Is you take somebody with no real resistance training history, their lats are very, very small and underdeveloped, and you tell them like flex your lat. They can't even just flex their lat, right? So it's like if you can't flex your lat just sitting here, what's the chance we're gonna be able to connect with it on a movement? And so they won't overload their movements until they like, I'm not feeling my lats, I'm not feeling my lats. Sometimes you just need to do um, movements that externally look good, and there's no way to do. You you can't really go from A to B in this scenario without using your lat. Overload those; your lats will hypertrophy, and as they get a bit bigger, you kind of learn to engage with them, and then you can search for that bigger mind muscle connection on the motions. And that's actually exactly like my my girlfriend started lifting right after I met her, and that was like the big thing was like we would do back exercises, and she she came from like a figure skating background, so she wanted to do everything right. Because you know she was drilled since a little kid, it's not worth doing if you're doing it wrong. You're not just not moving forward if you do something wrong. You're moving backwards by drilling bad habits. And wow. she was just trying to do that with bodybuilding. Um, but she's like, I can't feel it. I'm not going to add weight until I can feel my lat. And it wasn't until we just said, hey, as long as externally your form looks passable and you get your target reps, we're going to go up in weight. And she saw some hypertrophy to her lats. And once they were a little bit bigger, then she could start feeling them. And I think that is a pretty, pretty common phenomenon. And then like, the other part of this whole like exercise optimization thing is most people that I've met that are just regular people are uh, limited by their consistency of going to the gym or burning out on the gym and not taking it seriously as they once did or stopping entirely. So uh, if that's the most likely rate limiter, uh, then keeping training fun and enjoyable should be one of the biggest parts of optimizing. It. And if you really like, you know, let's just, let's just say I love Dr. Mike, but like the RP style of training and you feel like this is the most efficient way to get your goals and that gets you bought in and consistent with the gym and you're really invested. Awesome. But I think a lot of people get very bored training like that with these reps and reserve, these really slow cadences um, and, and not seeing as much overload as they could. Um, and that would end up burning them out. So yes, while we're taking a step towards optimization, that person wasn't going to be limited by the SFR of that set in terms of their long-term development. They were going to be limited by burning out. So I think enjoyment needs to be a huge part of this optimization discussion. Now, when you start working with like more competitive athletes who aren't going to burn out basically no matter what, then it's like, yeah, optimization becomes more and more important. So like the work Dr. Mike does where he's like taking IFBB pros through a workout, that might be very, very helpful for them. Whereas I think that like just learning to love falling in love, like learning to love training in general and training in a way you enjoy probably takes precedent over everything else for like the first bit of training until you're pretty deep sunk into this, right? Yeah, absolutely. I know when I started training seriously, like the, the, like the deadlift and the weighted pull up were like the two that just really excited me. So I understand that there may be some optimization opportunities with the lat pull down, but I just don't get the same joy that I get from the weighted pull up. So I just continue to do that more often because it just keeps you more consistent. Absolutely. When a vertical pull is a vertical pull, right? It's like, how much of a percentile difference if we had a hypothetical you that did the pull downs versus a hypothetical you that did the weighted pull ups? Are we even going to be able to parse that difference visually? Maybe not, man, especially if the you that's doing pull ups is more fired up for that work. You're like looking forward to it all day. You eat your meal because you're like, man, I love my weighted pull ups. I would go so far as to say that difference in motivation would probably offset that difference in like, you know, that small difference in stimulus. Yeah, I would agree. So I want to talk about your dislike for the current classification of beginner, intermediate, and advanced by rate of progression. Can you talk yeah, about that in more detail? 
Yeah, somebody got on me in the comments and said, oh, Mark Ribito already said it. Sure, I don't know. <laughs> I, I might have missed it. I, I don't care. Uh, but like, I usually, the I'm not going off of Mark's definitions. I'm going off of what I see on the internet. Most people say, okay, well, beginner just means you're basically progressing, doing no matter what. Uh, every session, you're getting stronger. Intermediate means it's slowed down a little bit. Advanced means it's gotten really slow. Um, and I know people that are, there's no way to describe them other than the beginner that are making very poor rates of progression, not because they're so well-trained and they've driven themselves so far from homeostasis, but because they're doing a really shitty job. Just because you're doing a shitty job and are progressing badly doesn't mean you're advanced, right? So I think I talked about on Bromley's podcast, like to me, it's not about like how strong you are either, right? Like I've known guys who are, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I'm very delusional. I'm very removed. All of my clients, like I'm very niche specialized. My clients are very, very strong guys. And I'm like, oh, he's average. And everybody's like, what the hell are you talking about? That's not an average person. Like, he's oh, well, only like, benching 385. Yeah, right. I'm like, yeah, he doesn't even bench 405. He's average, right? So it's like, yeah, exactly. So I'm like a little bit removed, but I've met guys that well below those, well, well, well below those strength standards that I think do an amazing job. And I'm like, you have to be advanced. You must be advanced with the level of process you're applying. So like, to me, uh, beginner, intermediate, advanced is more of a classification of your overall process. So like, is your program good? Is your intensity good? Is your like technical execution of your exercises good? And then that expands to outside the gym. Now you don't have to be a professional athlete. Are you doing a good job getting sleep within your life circumstances? If you've got five kids, of course, you're not getting that much sleep, but you do prioritize it to the best of your ability. That would make you advanced in my mind. Again, you don't have to be eating out of a Tupperware always, but like we talked about before this, if you make good decisions with your nutrition and you understand what you're looking at and you can look at a menu and you can parse what the best option to stay on track with your goals, you're advanced, right? So I view beginner, intermediate, intermediate, advanced, not as like a gauge of like your rate of progression, because that could be informed by how good or bad of a job you're doing. Um, and it's also not how strong you are, because I know guys that are wicked strong that are beginners. Their their process is poor, their diet's poor, their sleep's poor, their mm -hmm. technique is poor, the program is poor, uh, but they are the genetic elite. So people are like, well, he must be advanced. He's wicked strong. Not if you look at his like process, right? Um, so I, I, pretty strongly subscribe to this idea. And like, I kind of have a feel for the guys I coach or the people I talk to at the gym. I'm like, in my head, I've got like intermediate level process, regardless of how strong you are, advanced level process, regardless of how strong you are. And that's kind of how I do it because you see so much, like you can't use strength standards because people are just different sizes. Uh, like people say like, oh, is a three plate bench press achievable in just one year as a natural? If you're a giant person. Yes, absolutely. I've seen it done many times. They go into a football weight room and you can see that done several times by some guy who's six foot three and 300 pounds. It's a body weight bench. Of course he can do that. Right. And it's yeah. like, you know, some people are operating much smaller machines, in which case that would not be a realistic goal. So you can't use strength standards. Like if you get into powerlifting, you can use dots, but even then we see this wide variance in genetics to where that can't be our explanation. And I, like I said, I've got my qualms with rate of progression um, as our, our assessment. So we have to kind of do this more holistic. It's, it's harder to categorize yourself objectively because we all kind of bullshit ourselves with how good of a job we're doing in our circumstances. And it's like, some guy will tell me like, yeah, you know, for my circumstances, I do a great job of my sleep. And it's like, man, I can see that you're active on Instagram at like midnight every night. What are you talking about? <laughs> like that is not your life circumstances. That's just poor decision-making. So I guess you kind of have to move to this more abstract, which is no fun because nobody likes abstract because it's not, you can't just have a chart and find where I am on the chart. But I am advanced. Yeah. I think what's, what I was thinking about, which is interesting is like rate of progression could make sense if everything's optimized, right? Yep. So if you're in a situation where everything's optimized, your training, your recovery, your diet, so like you're eating in a surplus. And if all of that was intact, then you could use rate of progression. Absolutely. But you don't, but you don't know all of those variables. Exactly. And, and those variables aren't static. You know, I know great lifters that burn out for a while and they're not doing a great job with their nutrition. Like I've got guys I coach that are phenomenal elite lifters that they burnt out and it shows and the rate of progression slows down, right? Because they, they're like, Sam, I'm not going to lie. Like, let's redouble our efforts. I've been going to bed too late. I haven't been eating my meals. I haven't been on top of my mobility or whatever it is. Uh, so it's not even static um, among the same person. But yeah, absolutely. Rate of progression is a variable here. Because like you said, everything's static. Yeah, the further we get from homeostasis, the harder it is to get any further from it, right? Like each five pounds is a little bit harder than the last. But the rate of progression also isn't linear. 
Sometimes you'll, you'll spin your wheels for two training cycles and then have the greatest training cycle of your life and you hit a 20 pound PR. It's not that that third training cycle was so potent. It's that probably you did like manage to drive some adaptation for those first two training cycles, but failed to express it. And then you put, you expressed all three of those training cycles together when you managed to like nail your peaking phase and you changed what you messed up. And then it wasn't that you added 20 pounds of pure strength, that third one, it's that you maybe added another five or 10 and then displayed the five that you built the prior training cycles. So again, like rate of progression itself is, is kind of an abstract thing because it's sometimes we are having a good rate of progression and failing to display it because we manage our fatigue poorly through our peaking phase or what like we have a, we've got a fault in our technique. So our five RM keeps going up and up and up, but our one RM won't budge because it's not, it's not scaling. Yeah. We we've got a technical fault that makes those things not correlate. If your five RM is going up and up and up, your rate of progression is there. You're just failing the expression part of it. So it's like that whole thing gets tricky, which is why it's, it's super whack. And I understand why people want something a little bit more square than that. But it's like, if you really do want to classify yourself as beginner, intermediate, advanced, uh, we probably need to get to the point where at least intermediate, where we understand these things well enough to even say, right? For sure. And I think what's interesting is if you're talking advanced, I have a kind of a funny story where there's people who look at uh, professional athletes and if they're on Instagram and tweeting at like four in the morning, and then they'll bet against them in sports the next day on pro line or whatever, saying they're going to get under 15 points because it does impact their performance. And these are like pro athletes, but if they're tweeting at three 30 in the morning and they have a game at 1 PM, you know, you can figure out through that, that they did not sleep well and it's going to impact their performance. When we've got pretty robust literature that motor learning, recovery, injury risk, basically everything does tie to sleep. You know what I mean? Like that is pretty goddamn well established at this point. Like the, like not just your physical adaptations, not just, oh, I burn more fat when I sleep more and am less likely to burn muscle. All of these things are established, but your actual like rate of skill acquisition, right, is going to be better. Performance is going to be down. Like there's so many things that tie back to sleep, which is a shame because like I don't sleep well. I know a lot of people that like, even if they do their best effort, they have their sleeping supplements, they have a good wind down routine. They check all those basics of sleep hygiene. They just still don't sleep well. Um, you should still do the best you can, right? Like I don't, I don't pride myself. I'm not a great sleeper, but I do the best I can to sleep as well as I can. A good night of sleep for me might not be the same as a good night of sleep for you. Or my brother sleeps like a rock for like 12 hours a day. So <laughs> I'm quite jealous, but like I do the things I can because better is always better, right? Like I have my pre-sleep supplements. You know, I, I've got the dark room. I've got the cold room. I have a sleep mask on. I put earplugs in. Like I do everything I can to just make it a little bit better because I know that will give me returns. And there's no use in moping like, oh, I'd be so much better and I'd be tall like my brother if I could sleep more. There's no use in moping. It might be true, but there's no use in moping about it. Just focus on the things in your own control. Yeah, for sure. So now this next question may bother you because we just talked about how we don't want to classify lifters. So yeah. what are your top three tips to an intermediate lifter who wants to blow up their bench press this year? So I guess a lot of that depends on um, like the person, right? So if they're uh, there's like a certain BMI at which we achieve that BMI and training tends to go a lot smoother. People talk about like filling out your leverages. Uh, Boris Shiko used to have old height to weight chart. Um, I think it's a fool's errand to try to just speed run your way up to that height to weight chart. Uh, because again, most people have other things they care about and it's not just all about their lifting. Uh, and they might be really pleased with the bench gains they get. And then they look in the mirror and they really don't like what they see. And then they have to do a big cut and that bench comes right back down. And they would have been better off pushing up to that weight slowly within parameters of body fat that they're comfortable with. But I will say the easiest way to increase your bench press is to gain weight, especially if you're a skinnier guy, uh, in having the intention of growing with time, even if you just stay within the body fat that you're comfortable with, we probably do need to fill out our leverages a bit and gain that contractile tissue that I talked about is like bench in particular is not a very technical lift. You know, if you're reasonably technical, you're reasonably neurally efficient. A lot of bench pressing is just a, it's just who's got the biggest pec shoulders and triceps, the three primary movers. So a lot of our year should be spent doing a lot of isolation or compound volume to grow those three muscles. And we probably need the nutrition to support that. So I think that like, that's the first thing is if you're skinny, we should be trying to just get more jacked. That's more, one of the best things we can do. Um, a lot of people I think do respond well to increasing their frequency from one to two, or even two to three. Um, that frequency discussion is also kind of dependent on how mechanically efficient your form is and also your age. 
Um, older lifters do have maybe a little bit slower rate of healing for their soft tissue. So they can't lean into these really high frequency models that younger lifters might benefit from. And also if you have horrible stability at your shoulders, you don't know how to retract and depress your shoulders, uh, the depression of the scap probably being more important than the retraction. Yeah, of course your shoulders get banged up when you bench three days a week. It's not a problem with the frequency. It's a problem with your technique being very mechanically inefficient. You can get into a whole discussion of, is there such thing as good form, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but we can, we can move more efficiently and we can handle more volume. We can handle more frequency. And most people do respond well to that. So I'd say like the two biggest things that come to mind is like, hey, make sure you're filling out your frame. If you're someone who's coming from being over weight and coming back down, you don't have to worry about this one as much in terms of eating to fuel your training. You just need to do your, your volume to try to get more jacked, right? And then on the other side of things, we want to do want to get more neurally efficient. We want to get more skilled. And frequency is one of the most potent tools we have for training our neurology. And it's also one of the most potent tools we have for skill practice. If I told you like, hey, man, I'll send you $1,000 if a month from now you're really good at jump roping. You're not going to jump rope once a week. You're not going to jump rope twice a week. You'll probably jump rope two to three times a day, right? Because frequency is a very, very potent skill for motor learning. The difference between a jump rope and a bench press is jump rope easy to recover from. Bench press is a little harder. So that frequency does scale, right? It's the same thing of like, well, that doesn't mean we deadlift twice a day, seven days a week, right? We still have to work within our parameters from what we can recover from. But I do think if people ease into it and they split their volume across those two to three days, uh, most guys can build into maybe a 3x bench frequency if they're really keen on increasing their bench press. You can use variations. Um, I think that variations that focus on the bottom range of motion uh, in raw lifting, work on the bottom range of motion is seldom wasted. That's mechanically the most difficult part. If we look back at like equipped lifting, uh, uh, we have assistance from the shirt at the bottom uh, and it, we have to do more and more work ourselves the higher up we get in the range of motion. So the variation selection in like a lot of old conjugate models was very top end centric. If we're talking about raw lifting, we probably want to be bottom end centric with our variation selection. So if you're training for a touch and go bench, pause bench is a very good variation. Yep. Uh, Larson press, long pause bench, or even a press where you have the pins right on your chest doing a dead bench to pins. Um, also very, very good use of time. Did a lot of the time... Uh, you really just need to develop your pecs, right? Because if we think about um, someone who's very under-trained, we have some amount of neural efficiency and some amount of strength in our triceps uh, and some amount in our shoulders because we do day-to-day -day tasks with these muscles. We're not really doing a whole lot with our chest in day-to-day -day life. If you're not doing push-ups, we're not loading this deep stretch position. So it's a it's probably the least trained of the three muscles, and it needs to be brought up to par uh, for a lot of athletes. So early on in training, just investing in developing your pecs with pec flies and dumbbell benches and learning to load a deep stretch position and feel a stretch at your pec rather than internally rotate and feel a stretch at your shoulder. Learning that skill in hypertrophy in your pecs is worth its weight in gold. You can even just do basic, like after I bench press, I do 100 reps of push-ups in as little time as possible. That kind of protocol, a lot of intermediate lifters would benefit from greatly. Just to get in a bunch of volume, hypertrophy the pecs, it will benefit your bench. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people, when they think they want to increase their bench, they focus on technique. And I think technique is a good piece, but there's only so much you can kind of optimize your technique. And then at some point you just have to get bigger. Absolutely. I think there's kind of two parts to the, to this lifting game, right? Um, there's the part where we're talking about, like, I would say it's a combination of like neural efficiency, like our ability to maximally fire motor units paired with how mechanically efficient our technique is. So that's our ability. Like we have a given fixed size machine. How much weight can we lift with that machine staying the same? Right. We hone and hone and hone that machine. And that's like the game that like if you're an Olympic weightlifter, uh, I don't know what the weight classes are nowadays, but a 165 pound weight class, you're probably already shredded, jacked Chinese man. You don't have any room to get any bigger. So you're playing that game of honing and honing and honing that point to lift as much as you can with that machine. Um, but the other part of that game is building a bigger machine. Right. And some guys overemphasize one or the other. Some guys are like, man, you've really sharpened that point. You are lifting about as much as you possibly could with that size of machine. Let's go build a bigger machine. Let's just learn from bodybuilders in terms of the nutrition and a lot of the training. Uh, and you're already good at bench pressing. So that bench press will go up as that machine goes up. You're already really good at displaying strength. Uh, on the other side of the coin, I've known a lot of guys that just specialize in building the machine bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can find some of these guys on the internet whose technique is terrible. 
and they're throwing huge weights because they just like get bigger, get stronger, get bigger, get stronger. Um, and it's like, okay, buddy, you, you should probably start sharpening that point at this point and start like making your training maybe a little bit more specific, but you can go too far in either direction, but we're always playing that game of those two different parts of getting stronger. Awesome. Sweet. I think, uh, that advice was very useful. Uh, <laughs> Good. Thank you. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out some things you've said in the past and let me know your first thought or take on it. Okay. All right. Uh, so the first one is when you see a little bit of initial success, you think that this is the lift I'm genetically geared towards, and then you get your ego attached to it. So you think I am the bench presser. Yeah, I think that spiral, that's why a lot of people have lagging lifts. Um, I, I think that initially, right, like it's, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we see something that we're good at initially, um, we start to take pride in it. We start to look forward to those sessions. Maybe we watch videos on how to get better at that lift. And then it, it almost double downs, right? Like, yeah, we had that initial genetic propensity, or maybe it was explained by, by your, by your prior training history, right? We don't know. Uh, but we, we saw that initial bit of success and then we were like, we're the bench guy. I, oh yeah. Maybe I'm getting out squatted by my friends. But I, I've got a good bench press. And you start investing more and more of your total training economy, more of your mental resources into getting better and better at that lift. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm a big believer in well-rounded is harder and thus well-rounded is cooler, right? If a lift comes easy to you, maybe we should do a little bit less of that lift. We should use that like kind of genetic propensity we have to be good at this or maybe in, from a bodybuilding context, if your, if your biceps grow really easily, because we all have muscles that come easy and hard for us to grow, like my quads responded to training great. Uh, if I was a bodybuilder, that would probably mean, okay, well, that means I can get away with a little bit less quad training. So then I can focus more on the muscles that come difficult to me. Because a well-rounded physique is harder to achieve and thus cooler than the guy who's got, hey, yeah, his upper body looks eh, but his legs are crazy. To me, being like a one lift wonder or really leaning into one thing, while very cool and it'll get you a lot of attention on the internet, which is part of that positive feedback loop, to yeah. me, well-rounded is harder and cooler. So it's like, I think the guy that benches 600 with good, you know, a good squat and a good deadlift. To me, he's cooler than the guy that benches 660, but doesn't necessarily um, have much strength at all in the other two. Um, to me, that's cooler simply because I've come to the conclusion over time, oh my God, that's way harder. For sure. I think this actually uh, jumps into this next quote here, which is find stuff you're bad at and then do it. It it works pretty well as a training philosophy. Yeah. So that's that. I was always told that by people like, hey, just, if you find a variation you're bad at, just do that. Um, and I remember being really critical of that early on because I'm like, eh, you might just be bad at it because it doesn't fit your leverages. You might just be bad at it because it's it's irrelevant to what you're trying to get better at. There's, I was like, I could list all these reasons why you're bad at it other than it's attacking weakness. But the longer I've lifted, as long as it's a reasonably like, yeah, of course, balancing on a BOSU ball and juggling, right? I'm bad at it. It doesn't mean I should do it, right? We can all, we can, we can go down that route. But if there's a close variation of a squat that you're weirdly bad at, it's probably highlighting either a technical element of the squat that you could understand better. That's going to make you a more well-rounded overall squatter, or it's highlighting a kind of weak link in the chain in terms of your physicality. Again, you're going to become a more well-rounded squatter from working on it. So if we have any like variation that's reasonably close to the thing we want to get better at, that we're kind of bizarrely bad at, that doesn't guarantee that's the best variation to work on, but it's a good chance. There's a really good chance, right? For something that isn't like an absolute truth, that whole just do things you're bad at philosophy, it performs far better than it should. And it's really not a bad framework to pick things. As long as we're going with close variations, doing the ones that you're weirdly bad at functions unbelievably well as a training philosophy. Even if we could like zoom out and pick examples and poke holes in it, it performs way better than it should. It's a clue. It is. Absolutely. Right. So it's a clue. So you should at least investigate it and see if there's something there. And if there's nothing yeah, there, that's a little bit. But it's a clue that's saying, okay, there's a weak point here. Why? Absolutely. You know, and like I remember, I, I remember like I heard a long time ago, um, like Ed Cohen was always very posterior chain dominant. Um, and in his off season, he really wanted to work on his quads because he felt his quads were like kind of a weak link in the chain. Uh, and so he did close stance high bar for his whole off season as a way to target that because he was not, wasn't very good at it. It allowed him to use reduced loads uh, and it let him work on his weakness. Uh, and he, I remember there was like an interview where someone was like, well, did you do front squats? Because following that same rationale, it's a very upright squat, uh, maybe even more upright than the close stance high bar. Wouldn't that also help you attack that weaknesses? And he's like, I did. I gave it a try because I was bad at it. I ran with it for a while. 
Um, and I found it didn't work for me, right? So it's not going to be a one size fits all the thing you're bad at. It. Like, okay, well, there might be a couple of things you're bad at. And one of those might be best suited to attacking that weakness. But hey, if there's a commonality in these three exercises that we're bad at are all upright squats where we're pushing our knees forward, okay, we can conclude our quads are probably the weaker link in the chain. So we need to be doing one of them. Like you said, it, it is a very helpful clue. It doesn't mean that one in particular, especially if we know that there's overlap amongst the different exercises we're bad at. Like if you just happen to be bad at Larson press and long pause bench, okay, chances are you lack strength in the bottom range of motion and your pecs are underdeveloped. Yeah. Which one you do to fix that, you need to figure that out. But there's a conclusion we can draw, especially when there's two clues, right? One clue who knows what, what it might be your mid back strength with the front squat, but two clues will probably give you a pretty good shot as to what's going on. Awesome. All right. Next one. When I was getting into powerlifting, it's the only sport where I've been told to train harder was a stupid answer. Yeah. That was a really weird one for me. Just coming from like different sports, like, uh, you know, boxing, especially because it's a whole, like it, the, 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 t- the culture really revolves around mental toughness. Why are we doing this exercise coach? to build mental toughness. It's like a lot of the time, that's the only reason we're doing some things, right? Because that is a requisite part. Like there's physicality, there's skill, but there's also mental toughness is a huge component of your success within the sport. So we do stuff that kind of addresses that. And, you know, we're told that the guys that are beating you are the guys that are working harder. There's not as much discussion of genetics uh, within boxing, even though obviously it is a big, it is a big part of it. But that wasn't like a conversation I was really exposed to. And then I went and played other sports. And it's like the people that were succeeding were the people that practiced more and the people that practiced harder. Is there genetics in those sports? For sure. I am no man's fool. Like, obviously, that is a big role. But that's what I was told was like the biggest uh, explanation for the people that were excelling versus the people that weren't. And then I got into powerlifting and I wasn't you know, I wasn't part of a powerlifting club. I wasn't part of a powerlifting team. Uh, so the discourse I saw was online. And there, the people that were seeing the initial rate of progression that was good versus bad was explained entirely by genetics, right? And I was like a fool. And I would get in the comments and be like, well, maybe that guy is training harder. And I would get told that was like a dumb and like a dumb try hard answer, right? And I was like, I was like, that's, that's weird. It has to be at least a big part of this, right? And I've always said that if you, um, if you go to the gym and you see there's a, there's a, there's a gang of like broccoli hair high school guys lifting in the corner. Always, right? one of them is strong. Might be pretty strong, right? And then the other ones are just kind of tagging along because their friend is passionate about something. And they're tagging along, and they all are like, "Oh yeah, that the strong one. He's a genetic freak. He, you know, he's got great genetics." But if you watch them train, the strong one trains way harder than the other ones. Um, was there a feedback loop of it? He saw initial success because the genetics. Sure, but it's usually the guy that's the strongest amongst the gaggle of teenagers is also the one that trains hard. So that's like. That was a big, like, it was a very weird disconnect, like within powerlifting specifically, um, that was not at odds with what I was told in other sports and really caught me off guard. Yeah. I think it's like, was it, uh, hard work beats talent if talent doesn't work hard. So it's yeah, like, we know if talent works hard, that yeah. talent will win. Absolutely. And if talent's not working hard, you have a shot. Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's like, you know, you take a guy, um, who's really kind of in and out of the gym with phenomenal strength genetics. Uh, I would say a pretty averagely equipped guy who sticks with this for 10 years and hones his technique. He's smoking that guy. That guy, he regresses, progresses, regresses, progresses. Uh, strength training is a uniquely slow endeavor, but that also means you could have a real heads up on people by sticking with this for a long time. You know, there have been people, my brother, a uh, very gifted lifter, um, you know, it was like, oh, he's like top three strongest 14, 15 year olds and then 16, 17 year olds. And then uh, he was one of very few people to total 2000 below the age of 20. And then he was the youngest man to ever deadlift 800. But along that journey, um, there were people that were ahead of him. And those people that were ahead of him had been training for less time. So we're talking about people even further on the right end of that bell curve than him. And now he is stronger than all of those people that were ahead of him for 15 or 16, because they all burnt out on it. These people are even more genetically inclined to this than Max, but because this is such a slow, long endeavor, if you have staying power, that goes a tremendously long way in strength training. For sure. And how do you feel that your history with boxing and that hard work mentality helped you when you first really started getting into lifting? Because I know you kind of started very differently than most people, where you kind of started very process oriented and detailed. So do you attribute any of that to boxing? 
Um, so I, I, I think the biggest thing, right, is um, my work capacity was very unreasonably large because I was boxing and I was playing other sports at the same time. And then at one point I would get up, um, I would run for an hour and then I would take the bus to the gym, then I and lift weights, then I would go to school, then I would go to track and then I would go to boxing. And uh, I was not doing a whole lot of homework at this point, but Clearly. I would. Yeah, I was exercising for like six plus hours a day uh, just because I really I'm, I'm a bit of a nut. I really like that. And so I had this like monstrous work capacity that I built up and that let me take a higher volume uh, approach to training. And I also uh, from being yelled at all the time in boxing knew how to push myself. And I think that was a big part of it. Um, I think I've always had the theory that a lot of the reason my bench excelled initially was a we did a lot of push ups and built a lot of volume. So I didn't come in with particularly underdeveloped pecs. Um, from boxing. Yeah, my arms are short. Yeah, definitely. There's there's more going on there. But I do think that there's a tremendous amount of volume of calisthenics we did. Um, there's a lot of upper body calisthenics and there was no lower body calisthenics. So my bench kind of did excel above my deadlift um, and my squat quite a bit. And I think that was a part of it. And I, I've always speculated that there's also some overlap in terms of like punching for force. You learn how to maximally recruit uh, motor units in your upper body and Ooh. output force in a maximal manner. I think I was able to scale that skill to bench press. So I kind of started with the heads up. Like if you watch people who have not done much physical activity, their bench is all over the place and like mm -hmm. they're moving really slowly and the bar wobbles on the way up. And it's like, okay, well, you're clearly stronger than you're able to display. You're not very good at maximally uh, displaying force with your upper body. A lot of people are okay at displaying maximal force with their lower body because that's what sprinting and jumping is. But there's not as many tasks where we maximally display force with our upper body. And I do think having done a bajillion punches in my life, yeah. I started with a little bit of a heads up of like, well, how do you move powerfully to extend your arms? And so I think the combination of that with a bunch of calisthenics um, made my bench press take off a lot quicker than it otherwise would have. But I would say uh, boxing almost hurt me with that whole hard work beats everything else. Like, like I said, there was no specific reason. I didn't actually understand um, until later, what the process of sport preparation looked like and what peer like proximity, like, oh, what what skills are we trying to highlight? What physical adaptations are we trying to highlight? How does that change as we get closer to a competition? There was none of that. Like, yeah, OK, maybe I'm, I'm glossing up the language a little bit, but even those underlying concepts weren't there. It was just work hard, run hard, punch hard, you know, like don't give up. Right. Which can, gave me like a really big base of how to push myself, but it did not give me any base on how to push myself. And I think that really showed with some of my early training, um, the effort was really good. Uh, but the rate, like, so my rate of strength progression vastly outpaced my rate of technical progression, right? Um, there's two different models. I think I, I've mentioned on my channel a couple of times, there's two kind of different approaches to uh, your technical progression and your strength progression. Uh, you have maybe the very weightlifting centric model, the very Eastern European centric model of, okay, we're going to take you early. And until you can display very high level technique, we're not going to add weight. And then once you can display high level technique, then it's really easy. We just add weight each week, boom, pow, smooth progression, right? It's not worth doing reps. There are any deviation away from really nice. Um, or you have the more American model, which is, hey, we expect a beginner to have beginner level strength and beginner level technique. And as long as they get to, I, I know I'm using my classifications wrong here, but as long once they're like more intermediate level, we expect intermediate level strength and intermediate level technique. And as long as those things are in sync and equal, that doesn't represent a problem. It only represents a problem when we have advanced strength and beginner technique. And that's kind mm -hmm. of a deficiency we need to fix within our lifting. I fell into that category of outpacing my technique with my strength by quite a bit. And it did hamper my progress kind of through that intermediate phase where I, if I, like, if I had a coach and we used that European model of clean technique first and then weight, or just someone telling me like, Hey, equal emphasis on these two things. A technique PR is just as important as a weight PR right now. And you need these things progressing at the same rate. Um, I would have had a smoother intermediate phase because I blasted through uh, some very fast progress initially just off of raw effort. And then I hit some real resistance that could have been avoided if my technique had been progressing alongside that, but it didn't. So I had to kind of put the strength progression on the back burner to get more mechanically efficient. I had to really change how I uh, 
engage with the bar in my hand on the bench press to, to address some stability issues I was yeah. having at the wrist. I needed to better understand scapular depression rather than just scapular retraction, how to create a thoracic arch, how to train for a thoracic arch, how to create stability at the hip. There was all of these things that I needed to learn that I should have learned earlier that really put my like super impressive rate of progression on the back burner. Uh, and I hit some plateaus when the, that poor technical model that I was following kind of <laughs> kind of hit its upper limit. Yeah, but, you know, I think things work out the way they do for a reason, right? So you had the big rate of progression. So the numbers went up. So you got excited about that. And then you dialed it in when the time was right, as opposed to dialing it in first. So it's hard yeah. to know what's better in the long run. Like you could say that this is the the optimal way to do it. But I think however it played out probably is fine as well. Yeah, exactly. That's one of those things. I think guys beat themselves up too much. Like if I had in the fits around in the first two years in the gym, I'd be so much better off than I am now. Um, sure, that's probably true. But, you know, pontificating about it doesn't do anything. You no. should put that energy towards something that does something, you know, like, yeah, may maybe you do just take a mental note of like, hey, if I could do it again, I would have done this. And then you can help your friend who's getting into it, avoid those same pitfalls. Like the mistakes you made are learning, right? So there's something good that comes of them. Um, but in a, like, but there's no use in having any emotional response to it. Like, yeah, I can look back and I can, I can point to some things that I should have done better, but I don't like, I don't, it doesn't keep me up at night at all, you know, especially because I'm still getting stronger. I can implement those things now. Uh, it's not like I'm like, at the tail end of retiring and looking back, like, oh, if only I'd done things a little bit better in my career. I haven't reached my career peak yet. So there's no use, <laughs> there's no use in uh, worrying about these things. For sure. All right. I got one more here. The reason I'm not getting better is not that I need to find a high level concept. We're fucking something up. That's more likely to be an intermediate level concept. Yeah. So that's, that's a big one, right? Is like, everybody's like, well, I'm, even if you are an advanced lifter, absolutely. By all, by all means, you're an advanced lifter, right? Um, a lot of the time it's like we need, we're looking for this high level concept and we don't want to watch YouTube videos that are talking about inner. I get not wanting to watch beginner stuff. We're probably by, by this point in our lifting career, those aren't the mistakes we're making. Right. But a lot of the time people will like not want to watch intermediate level content because they feel like they're, they're above it or it's not the first time they've heard that idea. Like I've heard that before. That doesn't mean it's you're above that idea. Uh, because a lot of the time we've kind of let things slip. We, we redoubled our effort on our nutrition, but our sleep has slipped and slipped and slipped. And maybe me clicking a video, intermediate level video that talks about the benefits of sleep and how to improve it makes me redouble my efforts. And that's what kind of re-spurs my, a lot of the time these solutions are not very, very complex, high level training topics. Do high level complex training topics exist? Yes. And like the more I push into coaching like high level sports performance, the more I, like there is a place for those, but more often than not, if we're just in an off season, if we're not progressing, it's because we probably need to put our foot back down on the gas on some intermediate level stuff that we've heard before, because we can't, we, our brains are pretty limited. We can only focus on a couple of things at a time. So we try to lock into a good level of nutrition, but over time that'll gradually decay. And at some point we need to revisit it and bring it back up to the level we had it, or even to a higher level. So we revisit it, we bring it up to a higher level, we let it decay while we focus on other things. And then we bring it up to a new level. So a lot of the, like a lot of the time, it's just doing things that we know um, that we need to do, redoubling our efforts and taking it to a level that we haven't taken it before, but it's nothing new. Yeah. Sometimes it's just hearing the information in a different way, like hearing an analogy or hearing someone's story of how they used it or the challenges they have. And it clicks because it's the right uh, method of getting the information and at the right time for you. So sometimes yeah, you I have to hear things a bunch of times and you think you understand it, but you're not applying it. And then one day it clicks and then it's there forever. Yeah. I, I could not agree more strongly. Like I, that's why I still watch videos. Like I click, I read the title. I'm like, Oh yes, I, 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 I know I'm familiar with the talking points here, but you'll hear a different phrasing. And maybe that phrasing changes your understanding of it just a little bit. You know, I never thought about it that way. I'm going to like, when I take my level back up to the best it's ever been or slightly higher, now I've got a different angle I can come at it from, or maybe it just increases your buy-in. You're like, oh man, I never thought of my conditioning as helping my lifting in that way. That makes me really motivated to do better at these things. It's maybe not a new concept, but maybe I'm working the hardest I've ever worked at it. And that's what gets me back over this plateau a lot of the time. Yeah. It's working harder in a smart way. Right. Um, because, you know, another, another thing I mentioned on the channel often is, um, you know, you look at those that group of teenagers, the one that knows how to push himself will excel above the others. 
So how you differentiate yourself early in your training career, whether we're talking about hypertrophy or strength, is being someone that knows how to push themselves and likes to push themselves. And that will differentiate you from the majority, right? But then when we're pretty good and we're comparing ourselves to other guys that are pretty good, all of those guys are pretty good or like you. They're weirdos that like to push themselves in the yeah. gym and they love taking sets to failure and yada, yada, yada. Then it becomes a matter of, okay, we all have the effort. Who can apply that effort smarter? And that's where we get that second level of differentiation, right? In strength training, a lot of the time, the guys that are willing to push themselves to hell and back, they can always get stronger. The ones that don't know how to organize it well just hurt themselves every time they try. So it's not that they ever fail to get stronger. They just throw the kitchen sink at it. They just crush every muscle relevant to their deadlift and they do deadlifts often and they will get stronger just throwing the kitchen sink at the problem. But because they don't know how to organize that effort in an intelligent way, they get hurt. But it's not that they weren't getting stronger, right? Same thing with bodybuilding. If you know a guy who's unusually motivated, he'll throw the kitchen sink at a muscle. That muscle will grow. He probably might hurt himself. And that's where you need to learn more about maybe the programming side in terms of how to, and that's what, that's a lot of what uh, my job is, is I mostly only work with those people who have made that initial differentiation because they push themselves. And I'm like, Hey, I'm here to organize that effort to not hurt. Like, have you not hurt yourself? Right. You're driving the progress. I'm not driving the progress. My programs aren't anything super magical and special. The effort of the athlete is driving the progress. I'm just trying to make sure it's organized in a way that doesn't hurt them because they're driving forward whether I'm here or not. For sure, for sure. Um, so I know you've you know benched 600 pounds and you have a love for strongman. So what's your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite tests of strength? That's a good one. That's a really good one. Um, Squat, uh, it has to be. I'm uh, I'm not great at it, but I, I really put a big squat on a pedestal. Uh, and if I want to, to annoy my brother when he watches this, I'm going to say like a high bar Olympic style squat is way cooler than a low bar. Max does not agree with me. He does not get very much bonus points for like a deep Olympic squat versus a to depth powerlifting squat. I think it's cool. I think it's really cool. Uh, so I would say an Olympic style high bar squat would be my kind of general proxy for leg strength. Yep. Um, I guess I just got to go with a conventional deadlift as my proxy for kind of posterior chain strength. Um, now, feet of pressing. I should say bench because that's my best one. Um, but I think a heavy push press is really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, because it's the same thing as like, well, well, why don't you just not use your legs? Well, I use my legs when I bench press, right? Like we no one's saying, what can you Larson? Yeah, it's it's, not, Larson. it's every, not a Larson press contest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, every, yeah. Every time I post a bench, nobody says, well, what can you Larson press? Even though I'm using my legs and I'm pulling into an arch and I'm getting weight out of them. Trust me. I'm getting weight out of them. <laughs> you know, like that's the way I bench uh, as much as guys a lot bigger and stronger than me is by being strong and technically efficient. That's how I was able to keep up. So it's the same thing with overhead. By being strong and technically efficient, I'll be able to keep up with guys bigger and stronger than me. So it's weird to post a push press and be like, well, yeah, but what can you do without your legs? The legs isn't a magic trick. It's probably pretty respectable still. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Putting, it, I think it displays a level of athleticism that the strict press doesn't. And also I think the strict press reward, like for a max weight strict press, it rewards a layback. Like if you look at when clean and press was an event in the Olympics where you weren't allowed to use your legs, people would fall away from the bar, throw their torso back, uh, like that starting strength overhead press form. And I don't think that looks very cool. And that's what training for a maximal strict press rewards, whereas training for a maximal push press rewards a lot prettier movement. So I'm a little biased there. But if you look at like Klokov's 500 pound push press, that to me looks a lot cooler than like a 405 overhead press where you lay way back away from the bar. So that would be my my pressing strength proxy. Uh, I'm slowly buying into the the. I'm I'm starting to be on your team here. I used to kind of be like, I don't know why YouTube loves weighted pull ups so much, but I'm I'm starting to come around. It's taken me eleven or twelve years of training, but I'm starting to come around to understanding what all the hype is about. 
I think those are a pretty cool proxy for general upper body pulling strength, especially because the row is so like the row is a great developmental tool, but it's a terrible measure of strength because there's so much variance in how you can execute them. Mm. Like if you can use a lot, like you could be upright, you could be really bent over, you can do a dead stop, uh, how much torso sway you get, but also the speed at which your torso sways. So it's like if a guy has a very slow controlled torso sway, um, it's not likely that he's using his hip hinge to move a lot of weight. If a guy does a very explosive cheat row, it's very hard to compare uh, when these things aren't apples to apples, whereas a weighted pull-up is somewhat apples to apples. So the, the row is a great developmental tool, really, really good, but maybe not the best display of strength. Whereas I think we could argue if we're talking about upper body pulling, uh, the, the, the weighted pull-up is a better display or measure of upper body strength. Awesome. Yeah, that's fun. Hopefully uh, all four of those grow for you every year. <laughs> Hopefully, right? <laughs> uh, as long so- as they can. So what I want to touch on is, you know, kind of having big goals. So, you know, you've done the 600 bench and you mentioned that you have to be mentally ready for it. You need mental time to prepare and be fully committed because if you don't mean it, it won't happen. So do you have any advice for people that are always trying to rush the next goal? Yeah, I think a lot of that's not understanding what the next one takes and almost being like this, like you see someone and they do their first two plate bench press and they're like 315 next. Like, trust me, that's harder than you. There's more work than you think. Set a smaller goal. You probably have a lot more of an informed, like you just got your first two plates. You probably have a more informed idea of what it's going to take to do 235 uh, than you do 315. So how about we take that smaller goal that we actually know what we're talking about and use that as our motivation and like, okay, I'm going to need to get my, I can tell from that two plates, my chest needs to get stronger. My triceps need to get stronger. I need to push my body. Back. But I've got a pretty, like, even the guy who's pretty new to the gym can probably give me a pretty decent checklist of what he needs to do to get to that 235. No idea. I don't know what it takes to bench 700. I'm not going to talk about 700. I can't, like, I don't understand those long zoomed out goals. I don't understand how people derive motivation from something that they're just pulling out of thin air because it sounds cool when they actually don't know what it takes. And that's why I talk, like, when I talk about, like, you have to get your mind ready. I can't get my mind ready for 700 because I have no idea what that takes. You know, I know what it will take if I want to bench 610 and I can get my mind ready for that level of work because I know roughly what it's going to be. And I can do, I'm like, God damn, that's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard. And so I can derive motivation from that hard task. Yeah. 700 sounds super cool. And I can make a video in my head of me benching 700. That's like super cool, but I don't know enough for that to drive like genuine motivation. And that's why like people are like, well, what's your lifetime goal? I have no idea. I don't have the data set to tell you a realistic estimate. And if I don't really have data to base it off of, it's just a number I'm making up because it sounds nice. And I think that's the same thing with like younger guys who are like the next huge milestone. You don't know what that is. I'm not saying you're not going to do it, you just don't know what it is. You should focus on something that you know what it is and working hard towards that. And your progress will be a lot smoother than if you're talking about a hundred more pounds. Yeah, that's really interesting because I'm someone who has those really large goals, not necessarily just with working out, but just in general. So I can have that kind of uh, dreamy type of goal, but I know I have to just put one foot in front of the other when it comes exactly. down to it. So you can have that goal and you can fantasize and dream about it, but then you have to chunk it up and say, okay, what's the next week, month, three months, year like, and, and, and hopefully at the end of that year, I'll have more information that I can keep going there. So I feel like it's okay to have both, but you can't just have that huge goal and then not work on the immediate steps. Absolutely. Right. I think that those things almost need to be almost slightly separate in your head. You're like, I think having that self-belief that if you really put your mind to something that you can do it, right? Like I go, I see no reason I can't be a millionaire, right? I see no reason why not, right? I think having that, that mindset, I don't see any reason I can't do it. I don't see any reason. Like I remember back in the day, there was nothing to suggest I could bench 500. That, that would have been, if I said it a lot, most people would be like, yeah, Sam, do you know what? Like small percentile people like, sure, you're good at benching, but there's a lot of guys that are good at benching. I'm like, "I, I see no reason I can't. But it's not like I was like that 500 is what kept me going every day. It was focusing on like putting one foot in front of the other that kept me going every day. And I think that almost if anything, if you get those things blurring together and that really long term goal is what keeps you going, you're on the path to burnout because it's a far way away. You need to be able to focus on, like you said, that weekly plan, that monthly plan, maybe a three month plan. 
these things can keep you going. Um, but I know lifters that it's like the second they're like, let, let's say one of, one of my guys pretty strong, right? He just benched 415 pounds. Um, he really wanted, and he's like talking about 500, right? Instead of 425, right? Can he, if, if, if he says, Sam, I believe I can bench 500 one day and I really want to, I think that's cool. Good. I'm glad you, like you should believe in yourself. The fact yeah. that you're young and you've made it this far, I see no reason if you really, really gave it hell for a long time, I see no reason you couldn't. But the second he's like dragging himself into the gym and not hitting, hitting 425 isn't his motivation, but hitting 500 is his motivation. That's always a very bad sign to me because you're going to come to, we're all smart people. We're going to come to the realization that's not coming anytime soon. You know, you need to focus on that one week plan. Yeah. He has no idea what it takes to go from 470 to 500. Ex exactly. Right. Like that, that last 25 pounds, you thought this last 25 pounds was hard. That, that 25 pounds is going to be harder. <laughs> For sure. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw some images up on the screen Ooh. and, uh, I'll say who the person is. Tell me something you've learned from them and then what training session you would do with them if you met them in person. Let's do it. Cool. All right. Alex Bromley. Ooh, I love Bromley. I've learned, uh, I couldn't even give you a list, uh, especially like his old whiteboard content um, before he like started getting good with his editing. A lot. Like Bromley is probably one of the people with the most information for strongman, which when I was getting into it, the information for strongman was pretty limited and hard to find if you didn't know people to ask in person. So uh, basically a good chunk of everything I know about strongman I've picked up from Bromley. Um, if I was gonna, I'd probably do like a log press session. I would definitely do a strongman event session because I think I could pick up a lot of tips from someone who's competed as long, long as him. Awesome. All right. Next is Ed Cohn. Ooh, I have learned, uh, I would say a lot of how I structure my training, this idea of like, Hey, instead of just pitter pattering up, like, let's say you bench three plates, you shouldn't be benching over 295 every week. You need to dial back to like 60% and use that battering ram and gain momentum to break through just Amer traditional American block periodization of like an eight to 12 week block, dial back to 60%, try to end at 101%. Uh, he was my first exposure to that. Now I know that was a pretty common methodology back in like the eighties and it's called kind of just, it's kind of called American block periodization. And I am a fiend for American block periodization. So uh, a lot of my training methodology, if I were to do a session, I'm going to pick, I can bench more than Ed Cohn. So maybe I say bench press so I can have a lifetime dub, but I would rather do a <laughs> session and actually learn something. You can do both, okay? <laughs> All right. Next one is uh, Paris, bald Omni Man. Paris is the man. I would say probably Paris made me stop uh, stop underrating pull ups. If I if I was picking one thing, I was sleeping on the way to pull ups. I know Paris says his uh, his calisthenics bias. I was on the same page. I'm always, I'm a big on weighted dips um, as a bench assistance movement, as a bodybuilding movement. Big, big fan of weighted dips. I was already on the same page there, but I think Paris has finally won me over a little bit on the uh, the pull-ups. And uh, I guess going off of that, we'll, we'll train upper back. Awesome. I met Paris at the Arnold Classic. He was doing this like uh, row co competition at the Rascal booth. And uh, he was doing like strict rows with good form and everyone else competing was doing these like quarter rep rows. And it was like, it was embarrassing to watch because he had done such a good job at it. That's, that's a, that's a real, uh, that's a real extra victory to be the one person doing them clean. Yeah. Like each rep was, was clean. He wasn't doing them if they weren't clean. All right. These last two are going to be kind of fun. We got Marshawn Lynch. I love Marsh. I've got a Marshawn Lynch Jersey in the closet right over there. Awesome. What have I learned? Everything. Eat Skittles during your workouts. That's my number one takeaway. Uh, man, I geez, I would love I would love to do any training session with Marshawn Lint. That would be like a lifetime bucket list item. I'll work, I'll do whatever session he's doing. Awesome. And uh we got uh Rocky here. Let's go. We're doing the we're doing the uh is it the dragon flags he does during the training montage? Yeah, doing, yeah, yeah. And behind the neck pull-ups. I, I have watched the, uh, back in the day when I was an angsty teenager, I would blast 
Rocky, uh, Rocky training montages on my way to the boxing gym. I mean, it makes sense, right? You're like, yeah, right. It's the it's very you're gonna, you're gonna, and, uh, and, uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, the first Rocky specifically. The phenomenal opinion. The first Rocky, in my personal opinion, top 10 all time movie, the following Rockies, good movies, but not top 10. The first movie is as far as like actually be objective. My love for Rocky aside, far better. Have you heard uh, David Goggins talk about that and how? No, I haven't. What do you say? Well, he talks about how it's about he loses and it's the moral victory of him getting back up and kind of like that going the distance music in the background. Absolutely. And then he takes Apollo Creed's soul when he gets up. Like that's his whole take is like he didn't win, but when he got up, he took his soul. Well, I think that's why it's like I, I think that's why it's such a good movie is it's not cliche, right? Like it's not oh he's an underdog and he wins. It's the moral victory and how that is like there is no plot twist where he turns the tide in the twelfth round, right? It's it is the movie is about like toughing it out and the moral victory, which is why I like it more than the following movies, which kind of start to follow more that generic. It's going rough and then at the end the tides turn. Yeah, they have to do that as they go along, right? Yeah. Cool. All right, I'm going to finish today off with two books. Tell me uh, something you learned from these books here. Okay, let's do it. Uh, Atomic Habits and the Book of Five Rings. So Atomic Habits, I really like the idea of habit stacking, right? Like it's it's really easy to maintain a habit. It's hard to it's like establish a habit. So if you have an existing habit, you can tie a desired habit to that existing habit. So it's like, if there's something I wanted to do every morning, well, I brush my teeth every morning. If I pair that with brushing my teeth, it's a very easy way to start forming a new habit. And that's just like a genuinely helpful, small tip. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then the, the book of five rings is a, that's an interesting one because I read that for the first time a long, long time ago when I was boxing and I was reading it and I was like, this makes a tremendous amount of sense. You don't exactly have to be a genius to kind of scale these ideas to boxing. And then I keep coming back to it and trying to tie it to lifting. And it's a little bit more challenging for me for some reason. Like I, I it's not as one-to-one up. The reason is obvious. Combat is combat. Lifting weights is definitely not combat. Uh, we go to the gym. We are certainly not going to war, brother. Uh, but yeah, that's. I just love that book. Like it holds a, a spe- like a special place in my heart because I got it at the school library of all places when I was boxing, and I just remember being like, I I, don't know, I was a dumb kid, but I remember like it blowing my mind that like, oh man, this was written hundreds of years ago, hundreds, however long ago. 200, 100, some time ago. And the ideas like extrapolate just the same to what I'm doing today. Like, I remember that just being a weird concept to get my head around. And like, I've always, I like history a bit and I like reading uh, original texts, right? Like firsthand texts. And I always just think it's interesting. It's like, ah, man, people were just as smart back then, or all of these things are the same as they were back then. I've always thought that was something really interesting. Awesome. Sam, thanks so much for your time today. Where can everyone find you? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at Sheather Training uh, or on Instagram at Sheather, S-H-E-T-H-A-R. Awesome, man. Take care.